Hey everybody, this is Dr. William Clark here. Welcome to the Dr. William Clark podcast. Glad to have you guys in the house. Uh, for another episode, this is the podcast that focuses on nonprofit stuff where we specifically talk about nonprofit strategy and fundraising. I wanted to talk about uh, a topic that I've covered uh, in previous sessions, and I just thought it'd be a great time just to address this again. And this topic is around how to create additional time leverage for your organization. And, uh, you know, a lot of folks think about, um, you know, uh, the needs that they have and, and aren't sure how to solve those needs or how to address those needs, particularly because time is just such a precious resource. So let's let's dig into this a little bit. Before we do, I invite you to visit us at drwilliampclark.com if you would like to schedule a free consultation to talk about your nonprofit goals and to address topics around nonprofit fundraising strategy and leadership development. Again, visit us at drwilliampclark.com to schedule your free consultation. Now, uh, the time that you have is so precious um, as a nonprofit leader. And this is true up and down the organization, whether you are a board member, whether you are a senior leader, middle manager, or frontline team member. Time is so precious. And uh, that time that you have to get things done, uh, quite frankly, is consumed by the amount of work you likely have on your plate and the limited resources that surround you and your organization. And so when we talk about limited resources, we're talking about limited staff, limited money, limited time, limited, etc. And all those things add up uh, that creates kind of this time crunch and this time drain on you. And you find yourself struggling to figure out how do I expand capacity? How do I do more? And if you are in the position where you want to hire somebody or hire a group of people because you have a new grant that is coming online or you're looking to fill some open slots because, you know, uh, some folks from the organization have moved on. You're now dealing with the issue of how do I find talent that makes the most sense for our organization that fits within our culture uh, that aligns with where we are and where we're going and with the competitive job market still pre-COVID, during COVID, after COVID, you're, you're competing against other organizations for the same amount of talent. And let me add this here as well. Uh, you most likely are not paying the best wages. Um, we just typically don't have that capacity to do that in an industry because of uh, how we, you know, structure salaries, uh, the size of our grants, the size of our organizations, etc. I want to specifically address this, right? Um, because I think there is room to kind of rethink how we uh, staff our organizations and how to uh, provide competitive wages that are within reason for what we do and the industry that we're in. We are in, and in part, it comes down to uh, I think setting a new cultural standard that focuses on saying. Uh, we value these particular skills and abilities within our organization, and we're looking for these skills and abilities. That's number one. Number two, uh, it, it also moves towards talking about and thinking about uh, the values on the softer side of work uh, that you want to highlight. Uh, so this this is a reflection of, you know, the belief systems of the folks that join your team around the topic that your nonprofit uh, solves for or addresses. Uh, this uh, hovers around the idea of what team looks like and how team is defined, uh, how confrontation is handled in the workplace specifically. Uh, what leadership philosophy this person or persons uh, espouses uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, how this person addresses communication, their communication style, their communication approach, their communication preferences. And there are a bunch of other things that you may feel are important that influences your culture. We can't forget, right, development of strategy, innovation, ideas, etc. As you look at these skill things, these hard things, and you look at these softer things that influence and make up culture, um, it, it begins to help you frame out how to make the best decision for your organization. Now, as you're navigating through that, you might have to look at how you compensate for that talent acquisition process. Do we need to reevaluate our compensation model 
particularly as we are looking to fill specific roles that have such an important impact on the work that we do. This is going beyond saying, hey, do we need to compensate at the senior level differently, right? That that's, that's its own thing. But perhaps this conversation needs to kind of drill down a little bit more and focus on the step below senior management, middle management, frontline staff. How do we increase the availability of resources to fill those particular needs uh, so that our, our, our ranks are strengthened, so that our foundation is strengthened, so that our resources are well deployed and well utilized for an outcome that we are targeting for? So that is a conversation to explore with your board, uh, with uh, senior leaders of the organization. Is there a way to rethink the compensation model, uh, the salary, and all the benefits that come along with identifying talent? In the age of post-COVID, a lot of organizations are grappling with uh, this new reality that, wait a minute, during COVID, we had to pivot and we had to figure out how to work remotely. And uh, we have found that there were certain outcomes that we were able to derive uh, from working remotely. Now, there will be some that say that we weren't as productive uh, during uh, COVID when we were remote. There will be others that will say we were. I will tell you that uh, my team and I, uh, we were super productive during COVID when we were working remotely. Uh, But it came down to uh, just the culture that was set prior to, but even, even, uh, even pushing that to the side, the culture that we set during COVID, the, the foundation we set when we defined what it meant to work remotely, how did we intentionally and regularly engage each other in a virtual space that made it normal to see each other's face, to interact with each other, uh, to talk about things that are related to work, as well as portions of our personal life that we would typically share uh, in an office environment and, and still continuing that, that, that culture of saying that we value interacting with each other. So as you wrestle with that, that becomes a conversation uh, amongst your organization, its leaders, its board to determine, hey, did it work for us? And if so, how do we continue? If it didn't work for us, uh, what is what are some of the lessons learned that we we can kind of build upon? And what are some alternatives that we can look at? Because the workforce is really demanding something different of us as organizational leaders. I also drop this on you before I share kind of the uh, last tip here. The other thing to think about when it comes to virtual work, hybrid work, working remotely, uh, is that the leader or the leadership that's in place will often dictate the possible success of virtual work. And that is something to keep in mind, right? If you have a cultural preference to have people uh, in the office and you're just not a fan of virtual work because of your personal desires, then you will always see the negatives that are associated with working virtually and will not be the best champion. Just be honest with yourself, with your team about your preferences, because doing something opposite of that and not really uh, being clear with yourself about what you prefer and what you like to see and how, uh, you know, the choice to work remotely, hybrid or in person influences your ability to be at your best as our leader will impact the overall outcome. And I've seen leaders in the who in the face of seeing quantum leaps in productivity and outcomes and quality and success still said, I prefer people to come into the office. And it was not because of productivity, wasn't because there wasn't success or outcomes. It was because they felt more comfortable believing that stuff was getting done just because people were coming to an office. I gotta tell you, you might wanna reevaluate that premise because that necessarily is not true. Pre-COVID, during COVID, after COVID, people will tell you that, man, I can come to the office and I'm just as lazy or unproductive in the office uh, than at home where I just had to go, 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 go. And I got out work products consistently. Just consider that.
The last tidbit I'll share with you is exploring the idea of expanding capacity through staff by way of uh, uh, per diem staff, part-time staff, gig staff, okay? This becomes a huge opportunity for nonprofit organizations who are looking uh, to expand their capacity. Now, historically, nonprofits have done something like this and it shows up in a form uh, called a consultant, right? Uh, this is where you would hire a group like Lapatrick Patrick and company to work on your fundraising efforts, your strategy uh, design for the organization, maybe program design and some leisure development. And you wouldn't pay us the all, all the trappings of being an employee, such as the overhead costs, such as your medical benefits, such as uh, retirement benefits, etc. But you would pay the fee and you would get the service and uh, you would utilize the products that we would produce. So that still goes on today. That is viewed or that is used at a high level, right? To get high productivity, high outcomes. What nonprofits might wanna consider now, what you might wanna consider as the leader is how to duplicate that mentality of working with a consultant, but for frontline work. So think about how you can utilize a consultant or a gig staff person or a per diem staff person to help with your program recruitment, curriculum design, program delivery, training, case management, et cetera, et cetera. This does not exclude the usage of full-time staff because there is significant value in having full-time staff who's dedicated, who has institutional knowledge, who has understanding of the culture, et cetera. But when you're looking to do more, serve more, uh, expand capacity, it might be in your best interest to combine both ideas that we're talking about in this particular podcast, podcast, and that is looking at how to rework your compensation model where you're paying your core staff, your full-time staff more uh, to not only produce more, but to oversee processes and to shepherd the culture and then creating enough financial room to pay per diem staff to help uh, lift the work and to do some of the heavy lifting without having to make a full commitment to that person. This can significantly expand capacity. This can improve morale because you're paying your core staff more. This can expand your ability to do more. Your productivity will significantly increase, et cetera, et cetera. And this really could offer a huge, huge, huge opportunity for you to reevaluate how effective your organization can be at performing its core work and meeting the goals that it has set for uh, itself. This is just something to consider. Uh, this is something that entrepreneurs utilize all the time to expand their capacity, to do more, to be at more places, to produce more. And I'm encouraging you to think about this and how it can possibly work for your organization. Now, if you would like to schedule time to meet with me to talk about this idea or other ideas relative to the growth and expansion of your nonprofit organization, I want to encourage you to visit me at uh uh, drwilliampclark.com again drwilliampclark.com click on schedule a free consultation we'll be glad to speak with you about your goals with that being said this is dr clark we'll see you guys later